I'm Gwendolyn Osborne. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We are in for a treat as we are revisiting the Judgment of Paris from 1976. We'll be talking to legendary wine expert, um, visionary author, and now vintner, Stephen Spurrier, as well as tasting and talking about Stag's Leap wine cellars with winemaker Marcus Nataro. The wines we are tasting in order are the Stag's Leap Wine Cellars Caria Chardonnay and the Stag's Leap Wine Cellars Artemis Cabernet Sauvignon. We are going to be also talking about the SLV, of course, um, but the 2017 has just been released and I know it's not quite available everywhere. So now let me introduce you to our guests. We have uh, from Napa Valley, winemaker of Stag's Leap Wine Cellars, Marcus Nataro, and of course, the one and only, joining us from England, very late at night, Stephen Spurrier. Welcome to you both. Thanks for Thank having me. Hi, great. Um, so excited to have you both here with us to tell this story. Uh, Marcus, I wanted to start with you as a winemaker to kind of set the stage of Stag's Leap Wine Cellars 50 years ago, because Napa Valley was not the Napa Valley we know 50 years ago. So can you tell us a little bit about the foundation of Stag's Leap Wine Cellars and SLV? Sure, it certainly was not as it is today. You know, back in the 70s, it was kind of a reemergence of the Napa Valley. It was still kind of recovering from that great idea called uh, prohibition. Uh, maybe, maybe, only, maybe only 50 wineries around at the time. And that's when our founder, uh, Warren Vernarski, in the mid 60s, he had moved his family out from Chicago to the Napa Valley to become part of the wine industry. He had worked as a winemaker at a couple spots, but was really looking for land, looking for a place uh, to have his own winery and to grow grapes. Um, 1969, he tasted the homemade Cabernet Sauvignon uh, from Nathan Fay. Uh, Mr. Fay was a pioneer in what is today the Stag's Leap District. And as Warren says it, as soon as Mr. Fay opened up his Cabernet Sauvignon, it was the perfumey red fruits, the aromatics alone, that, that was his epiphany, his aha moment. He had found the style and the quality that he was looking for in Napa Valley. There so happened to have been 40 acres of land for sale right adjacent, right next door uh, to the Fay Vineyard that was planted to mostly prunes, uh, which at that time were more valuable than wine grapes, uh, along with some nuts and some grapes as well. And he purchased uh, that property and uh, then planted Cabernet Sauvignon there in 1970. But now I wanna fast forward to 1976, Stephen. When you came up with this idea for the Paris tasting, which of course we now know as the judgment of Paris, uh, I know you were a supporter of California wine and quality winemaking there, but while many others were not. So what was your impetus to, to have this tasting? What were you hoping to achieve? Well, uh, <clears throat> I'll cut you straight short there because okay. um, I knew nothing about California wine <laughs> sure. uh, from 1975. And it was actually my partner in La Cadre de Vin, Patricia Gallagher, who is American, and her family came over in the late 1600s. And um, <clears throat> I founded La Cadre de Vin back in uh, very early 73. And Patricia joined me, and she got furious every July 4th that she couldn't find any American wines in Paris. And because La Cadre de Vin was the only English speaking wine school in France, and um, <laughs> there I am. There you are. 1981, 10 years on. Um, <clears throat> and I had a very successful and becoming well-known wine shop. Um, California Vintners came into the shop and also Robert Finnegan and Alex Bespaloff and Frank Pryor bringing California wine. Well, my wife is one quarter Californian, but that didn't help at all because she didn't know anything about California wine anyway. But Patricia became so keen on these, she said, we must do something about it. We had done tastings at La Cadre de Vin. We were really the only game in town uh, giving, uh, giving tastings. We had the only tasting room. No one gave tastings in 1974 or five or six. They weren't interested in communication. They were just interested in selling. So. Uh, we'd got wines from the Chilean embassy, wines from the Australian embassy. You know, we'd, we'd given tastings of, of non-French wines before, but this was different because it, we were so impressed by the wines. <clears throat> so Patricia says, we must do something about it to get recognition for these wines coming out of California. 
So I said, first of all, Patricia, we're now in August, you've got your September vacation coming up. You spend a little time in, in, in California and in Napa, contact Robert Finnegan and he'll show you around and come back with what you think. And I said, secondly, when you've thought about it, we need a peg to hang it on. So Patricia comes back in late September raving. She's been to Montelena, she's been to Stag's Leap, she's been to a few other places. I th think I was the first person to go to Heights and to go to Ridge. But she came back and said, we've got to do it. I said, OK, Patricia, we'll do it. But this is going to be much bigger than anything we've done before. And we're going to get nine tasters, or we're going to get the best palates in France to do it. And we're, this is going to be quite different. But we need a peg to hang it on. And she said, I've got the perfect peg. 1976 is the bicentennial of the American War of Independence. So I said, well, Patricia, you know, we British don't really celebrate that because we lost the colonies. But I'll go along with it because it's your idea and it's a great peg. So we then get the tasters, Ober de Vilaine from the Romandie Conti, Pierre Tarry from Chateau Gisco, Pierre Brejou, the head of the Institut des Appelas de Contrôle, Odette Kahn from the Revue de Vannes de France, Raymond Oliver, the most famous chef in Paris, um, Christian Vanneke, the head sommelier, youngest head sommelier at the Tour d'Argent, Claude Rignan, the owner of Taillevent, uh, Michel Dovaz. Anyway, we got our nine judges and they all said yes because we were so respected. And another thing, we never... <laughs> yeah, I know, I can tell you, we've been in lockdown here for almost four months and my hair is now as long as it was in 1970. <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. But anyway... We got it all set up, and um, I've got your other question. Why was it a blind tasting? Yeah. Okay. It was a blind tasting. Um, I select, made the final selection of wines, six Chardonnays, six Cabernet Sauvignons, and thanks to Joanne Dupuis, as she was then, she was bringing a group of 24 people, um, uh, the, including Andre Cherichev, Louis Martini, and it was a wine tour of France. And I'd already had a problem bringing English wine back in 72 into France for the visit of the Queen. And I knew that I was only allowed as a single person to bring in one bottle of non-French wine. So how the hell could I bring in 24 bottles? So I begged Joanne to bring in the bottles with her 24 people. So that was 24 bottles, 24 people. And if she hadn't done that, thanks to TWA, the wines wouldn't have arrived and we wouldn't be speaking. Anyway, so that was, everything clicked in. Everything was a bit of love. So then the wine group come to Paris and I give them the big tasting of French wines at La Cadre de Vin, and off they go on their 10 day tour of France. Okay. About a week before the tasting happened, I said to Patricia, you know, I'm very worried. We've invited these people to taste California wine, but with the exception of Ober de Villain, uh, the owner of Romney County, who is married to a girl from San Francisco, Pamela, he will be the only person who will have ever tasted these wines before. Maybe Christian Vanneke, but the rest of them are a certain age and, and they'll know that California is on the West Coast, a bit north of Mexico, so they'll know it's a hot country, which indeed it is, and my worry is they're going to view these wines rather like they would view wines from southern Italy or southern Spain. And they will be polite about them. How can they not be? But I was terribly worried that they would damn them with faint praise, saying, well, c'est pas mal, c'est vraiment, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but we wouldn't get the recognition I wanted. So she said, well, how are you going to do that? I said, I'm going to make it a blind tasting. And I'm going to put in the four best white burgundies from my shop and the four best red Bordeaux's and we'll just taste them blind. And then it's a game. It's not a competition, it's a game. We'll just see what comes up, okay? So the whites were Bata Morache, Puligny Premier Cru, Merceau Premier Cru, Bone Claude Mouche Premier Cru. The reds were <clears throat> Chateau Aubriand, Chateau Mouton Rothschild, Leo Lascars and Chateau Morois. Similar vintages, okay? So Patricia said, but our judges, and they weren't judges, but our friends have come to taste California wine. They haven't come to taste 
take part in a blind tasting. And I said, well, when they come, I'll tell them that this is what I propose and I need their permission. So I told them what I proposed. I asked their permission. They said, bien sûr, ça va être amusant, pourquoi pas? Okay, so the scene was set. Well, we both know what happened. Um, in the whites, six judges voted for Montelena and three for Chalone. Not a single judge voted one of the white burgundies top. Because we were running out of time, I announced the, I had time to announce the result of the whites beforehand. They were surprised, but not shocked because they had all voted for California wine. Okay. Um, well, they didn't, yeah, they knew they had because they had the numbers on it. Okay. So the reds were set up and my impression was, well, it's not an impression, but it's absolute certainty that one or two of the judges, when they came across a California wine, they were going to slam it. They didn't want this to happen again. We were marking out of the 20 point scale and some of those wines, the California wines got two out of 20. Well, you don't do that. You, you, you know, the wines were good, uh, maybe 10 if you're being mean, okay. But, but Stagsley came top and I've been through the numbers. People have complained that just taking nine judges, adding up their marks out of 20 dividing by nine is not statistically correct. Well, I've gone through it time after time in different ways. Stagsley won the tasting. And it is my opinion, since I'm talking to Stagsley, and I'd like to congratulate Marcus, by the way, on maintaining the beautiful harmony and fragrant and supple style of Stagsley. Yes. I think they bet Stagsley because they thought it was French. So that's my opinion. So uh, did I expect the outcome? That was your other question? No, of course I didn't. I would have been happy to get a third or a fourth or a fifth, just two wines in the top five, as it did. I did get two wines in the top five, but we got, we got the winners. Well, you know the result of that. And, um, and I think, um, well, I'm very happy to be here talking about it a bit with Staxley Vineyards in memory of Warren, of course. Um, but his wine was so elegant and it won 126.5 against 125. And Mouton, in the three tastings I did, 86 and 2006, Mouton always came to top of the French. Now, um, Gwendolyn, your last question was, what did you make of this tasting being a seminal event in the history of wine? Okay, my answer to that, that it, it was, because it happened in Paris with impeccable judges, and Paris was Swadis on the center of the world, wine world, all that, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and it put Stagsley and Montalena on the map, it put California on the map. But the most important thing, absolutely the vital thing about this tasting, which is why it's gone down in history, is it created a template whereby little known wines of quality could be compared against or with the top known wines of quality, and if blind, of course, and if the judges were themselves of quality, the opinion of the judges would be respected. And that template has been, has been remade all over the world. You've obviously heard of Eduardo Chadwick's Berlin Tasting and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that, it was just a seminal event. It happened in Paris in an impeccable way. Mm -hmm. I've got an empty bottle, an empty magnum of ah. the class 23, there it is. And also it's got a wonderful um, special bottling. This is when it was sent to the Smithsonian. Oh. With the the uh, Arc de Triomphe, they were um, anniversary. Not many oh. people have one of these. Well, and I'm glad I'm it's empty. That means you enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. It... But and then we go to SLV. Is it Seventeen. 17 and, it's, and it's a brilliant one. Yeah. And how? Yeah. How a little bit have you seen it change when you think about what the '73 tasted like versus the winemaking well, style the now? Well, it was was lighter, and I think it probably probably not more than 12.5 degrees alcohol. I the 17 is 14.5, I mean, the, the vineyard so much riper, but it's not got any of the fruit bomb. It, it's not a fruit bomb. Um, anyway, Brenda, thank you very much. Thank you so and much. To, and to all at Stag's Leap, and congratulations on such wonderful wines. Marcus, particularly. Yes. Thank you. That's brilliant. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Take care. Thank you. How do you think 
if any, winemaking methods have changed for wines from that original tasting to now that kind of affect the style sure. that we get. Sure, and I, I actually would echo um, as well uh, what Stephen said. I mean, vineyards ha have changed, uh, they've evolved. I mean, we have um, um, a 1972 planting in SLV that still survives. Remember a lot of the vineyards uh, in the mid eighties, early nineties in the Napa Valley needed to be replanted uh, due to phylloxera. Uh, that's when a lot of the vines started to decline. And so a lot of the vineyards had to be replanted. We still have a 72 planting and it's fun to go up there. And those vines are, you know, they're big vines and they're big row spacings because that's the size of the tractors. And then to look down at the younger vineyard, uh, which is not really yet young, but to see the more modern way that we plant vines, which are a little closer together. They're different rootstocks. There's different systems. The vines, grape vines nowadays are much, are much healthier. And, you know, with any wine region, I mean, the first thing that you do is you're going to plant grapes, right? See what grows, see what your characters are. But as you learn and then you develop and you adapt and um, the Faye Vineyard would be a great example of that. You know, the Faye Vineyard is the vineyard that inspired Mr. Wernarski to purchase the land and plant SLV. But that vineyard, when it was first planted in 1961, it's just big, long rows, bottom of the hill, top of the hill, right? Like a quarter mile rows. Well, when that vineyard became part of Stags and Wine Cellars in the mid eighties and needed to be replanted, um, it, it was subdivided because, oh, the soil types are different. So wherever soil types are different, well, grapevines are gonna grow different. They're gonna get ripe at different times and let's mm -hmm. try some different clones, some different rootstocks. So viticulture is always evolving, uh, trying to yep. produce ripe grapes, but not overripe grapes um, consistently from year to year that can adapt to warm years and cold years. Um, wine making too is different. Um, that 73 was fermented in the cellar that you can see right behind me. And when that cellar was first built, it was a very modern cellar. Uh, things like cooling and malactic infiltration, those were all new things at the time. Um, but, you know, in wine making, I mean, there are today the different choices that we have, let's say in terms of barrel cooperage. I mean, um, there's multiple different barrels that we are able to select from that can we can pick and taste and enhance our wines, the different types of yeast, other techniques and technology that we have. Um, there's just so much, um, so much more things that we have to choose from. But that being said, with all of the tools that we have today, um, it does really go back to the farming, growing grapes, getting them right, but not overripe. Uh, it's up to me and my winemaking team to pick those grapes when they're at the optimum flavors that are ripe, but not overripe, and then to ferment them the best that we can, we using our senses, using our taste, using our experience to bring out the characters of our vineyards. And that is the, uh, that's something that doesn't change. I was about to say, so there's many things that stay the same and then you just have to kind of work in all those advances and things that change. Also like, you know, climate also, you know, you're kind of factoring all these Things that you bring that's in personally. That's why it's so fun. That's why it's so. But it's so fascinating what we do. You know, every vintage is a new vintage. You know, we're getting ready for the next vintage here now. We're actually going through Verasion here with the grapes. Oh, nice. Purple and and uh, you know we're preparing. You know, you remember what you did in the past and you take notes and you go out in the vineyard as often as you can to get clues for how to ferment. But in the end, it it's going to be in September and October and what you're seeing in front of you and trying to bring out, make the best wine you can that expresses uh, the area where the grapes are grown. Okay, well, that makes me want to taste some wine. So, um, Caria, the Caria Chardonnay, uh, which means graceful in Greek, which is kind of what I want out of every Chardonnay I drink. I want it to be graceful. So, um, can you, uh, you know, taste, when was the first vintage of this one? Well, we've been producing a, a Napa Valley Chardonnay since like the 70s. Yeah. Um, but the vintage, we, we named the wine Caria starting in 2005. Okay, great. So let's um, let's taste this. Maybe you can talk us a little bit through what we should expect sure. and kind of your style goal. Yeah, so style, again, style comes from the vineyards. Um, I think you need to match your winemaking style to that. Stag's Leap District, I'm going to talk Cabernet quickly. Stag's Leap District Cabernet, like SLV, it has this soft power to it. Um, and they're very complex in terms of lots of different flavors that are going on. But the wines from here never tend to be too over the top or too heavy. And that style that is in our state wines, I also want to see in our Napa Valley wines like Caria, Artemis, or Aveda, or Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc. 
So caria does mean uh, graceful. Um, and so I'm trying to produce wine that, uh, yes, there's some barrel fermentation here, but hopefully it's just kind of subtle and in the back has a little bit of a creaminess. But what I really want to push is our vineyard. So uh, we source grapes from really four key areas for, car for caria down in Carneros, which is, you know, cool Appalachian right next to San Pablo Bay. Chardonnay's there have this really nice, you know, like a banana and apple and melon note. Uh, we have some vineyards in Oak Knoll, uh, which is a little bit warmer. Uh, there it's like apple and uh, a ripe cantaloupe characteristic. Uh, we source grapes from up on Atlas Peak, which is a great appellation for Chardonnay, a little more lemon limey. It's like a mountain appellation for Chardonnay. And then down in Coombsville, the Arcadia Vineyard. Uh, this also is a cooler area and produces a really unique Chardonnay, more of a floral and mineral kind of a honeysuckle note. So those are some of the characteristics that I'm looking for. Again, I think it's important to be able to smell and taste some of the areas where, where the grapes are coming from. In terms of texture, wine has nice bright acidity to it. Uh, I want it to have be, 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 drink, be drinkable, but still have enough bright acidity to it so that you can pair it with a variety of foods. All right, uh, let's move on to Artemis, goddess of the hunt, um, Cabernet Sauvignon. So I know this is part of state and part part growers. Um, so when was this one, the Artemis, or first produced? With yeah, Artemis? again, we've been producing Napa Valley uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, from around the valley for, for years before, but uh, 2001 would have been the first vintage that we called wine. Gave, gave it a name. name. Gave it a name, Artemis. All right, perfect. I love it. Um, Artemis is, uh, you know, the goddess of the hunt. Uh, she's the protector of the stag, which of course is very appropriate for our area, for our label. Uh, but for the wine itself, it is meant to be a hunt around Napa Valley. I mean, Napa Valley is a wonderful place for growing this variety. Um, and depending on where you are, whether you're in the southern parts of the valley or the northern parts of the valley, or depending on the different soils Cabernet is grown in, it has a different character. Um, and I mean, different and, and it could be great quality, but just different personalities and different character. Mountain Cabernet, say growing up on Atlas Peak, tastes different. It has a different character than, let's say, uh, Cabernet growing up in St. Helena or in Stag's Leap, where, I, as I mentioned, our Cabernets here have this real soft power. So that's what I'm trying to capture with Artemis. It's, I'm trying to make the best expression of Cabernet Sauvignon from the Napa Valley for the vintage. So we do use, uh, again, a state fruit uh, coming from Stag's Leap. Uh, we'll also work with some Cabernet Sauvignon from up in the northern part of the valley, let's say up in St. Helena, Calistoga, uh, a little bit of grapes from Rutherford, where Cabernet's there, you know, they have a little more softness, a little bit more like a dark fruit uh, aromatic. Uh, to balance that out, we'll go south down to Coombsville, um, over in Wooden Valley as well, where it's a little bit cooler and Cabernet's there have a little more of a red fruit component, a little more of a brighter acidity to them, bright fruit. Uh, and then mountain areas. Again, mountain areas are very unique in Napa, uh, being above the fog, literally volcanic soils, and Cabernet Sauvignon Downs, let's say from Atlas Peak, they have a, a sage and huckleberry and dark fruit character and, 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 and rich, rich tannins. So those are the different areas. Artemis is primarily Cabernet Sauvignon. I may blend a little bit of some other varieties in there, a little Malbec or Petit Verdot or a little bit mm -hmm. Merlot, but it's primarily uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. I know most of your wines have such amazing potential for longevity. But um, ability is certainly, you know, it's an important characteristic for our wines. Um, Faye, SLV, Cast 23, these are wines that you can sell her for 30, 40 years. Um, as a winemaker, it's very important to me that our wines have ageability. Um, you know, I take it very personally. I know folks are purchasing our wines and yes, they may be going to drink them tonight, but they also may be putting a bottle away for their kid's 21st birthday or for a 30th wedding anniversary or a, or a big birthday party or something like that. And our wines, you know, are, are, I want our wines at the table when those things are, our, our events are going on and the wine damn well better deliver uh, when it's over. So Artemis, Artemis too. I mean, I'm, you know, in terms of uh, the style of the wine, mm -hmm. you know, again, I was always taught that a wine does not need to be undrinkable when it's young in order to be ageable. It needs to have that perfect balance between fruit and tannin. As wines age, the fruit softens, tannins soften. If the wine at bottling isn't in that right proportion, well, 30 years from now, it's still not going to be in the right proportion. Yeah. The wines are wines that age together harmoniously like that. So Artemis II, um, the way we handle the wine, 
I'd love just to see if someone does want to open it up, a 15, 20, 25 year old bottle, I expect it to deliver. I mean, we opened 2017 SLV, which is a very, very young wine. And it's a wine that has great potential for, for aging, but it's not, I don't think it hurt Mr. Spurrier to drink it, taste it tonight. And it's not hurting me. I have had a little bit in my glass uh, right here, but let's say you had three bottles or you had six bottles um, and you did like, when would be the first one time to open one? And I, what I say is, you know, you look at the vintage, you probably add six or seven. And that's the time when the wine is still young, um, but it's just starting then to, 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 it's soft, to soften and some of those edginess of a young Cabernet yeah. Yeah. Are, are just starting to soften. Um, and then, you know, the next time they'll open the bottle, maybe in 20 years. Right now for our wines, um, the vintages that are really singing are from the mid nineties. So 1993, 1995, 1996, those are the wines that when we've opened them or had the occasion to open them. And since this is our 50th, yeah. anniversary year this year we've taken the occasion to open a few uh, <laughs> right. it, it's really fun it's like that, that is why you hold on to some of these wines or at least hold on to one uh, for that special occasion in time to yeah. open it. well that that the wine can be the special occasion that's always what i like when people yeah. say so um i know not everybody at home or who's purchased the wines has the slv but i know many people have tasted it or have older vintages like we we're talking about stored away and this is the one that started it, where it was planted at Stagleet's um, Vineyard here. So tell us about this about vineyard. This vineyard. I guess here it is. And what about this vineyard do you think makes it just so right and appropriate for really stellar Cabernet Sauvignon? Right. Well, for, certainly the site is amazing. Um, our vineyard manager, Kirk Grace, calls Stag's Leap uh, the Goldilocks zone for this variety. And you know any variety you need this combination of both heat and also and also cooling. That's the that's the, the first thing that defines an area. And you probably saw in those pictures those rocky outcroppings that are surrounding uh, the vineyard. When Mr. Fay first planted Cabernet here in '61, it was thought to be too cold. Um, it was just thought to be you know white wine country. But luckily he planted Cabernet then, and then later you know they found that oh you know this little Appalachian that's on the east side of Napa, of, of, you know, next to the Silverado Trail, because of the bowl that it's in, surrounded by these rocks, that it does become quite warm uh, in the early afternoon. But we are south, you know, we're about five miles north of the city of Napa. And so the cool sea breezes that come up from San Pablo Bay, they start to reach us around 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon to cool us back off. And then the fog rolls in at night and the fog opens us up back up again at like 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning. So we have this beautiful combination of heat and cooling, which is kind of our, our, our defined. And that's why I think the wines have this soft power, but for sure the soils too. Um, the soil in SLV, I actually grabbed a little bit here to show you. Nothing like good dirt. Nothing yeah. like some good dirt to grow Cabernet. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the color of this dirt is uh, very red in color. It's young volcanic soil that has just very re more recently been washed off of those red rocky outcroppings that surround our valley. So it's that combination then, the right heat, the cooling, this soil that really uh, gives the personality to SLV. And SLV's personality, when I taste it as a young wine um, or, as a, or an older wine, um, it has this dusty cocoa powder character to it. It has this like violets, uh, black or like black currant. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, it's a rich wine, um, but doesn't tend to be too over the top, um, has incredible potential for ageability. And, and again, the personality of it is what I love because you can see that in the old wines and you can see that in the young wines and yeah, you're going to have riper years or colder years or wetter years or, you know, every year is a little bit different, but what makes the vineyard great is when you do try, you see the old and the young and the young, uh, in the old. And even when we tasted that, uh, the 73. Uh, you know, you can get the brightness. You can see some of the, the current aromatics, some of the cedar, some of the tobacco um, that I see in the young wines um, that we'll see in the young wines uh, as harvest starts here in a couple months.